People know more about their cell phone than they do their own cells. We've lost the ability to really tune into what, we, what it is we need because we're driven by want. Hello, I'm Amisha and this is episode 11 of The Future is Beautiful. Please support us on Patreon if you love this show. This week, my guest is Tony Riddle, who is a natural lifestyle coach. He shares ways that we can connect more with nature and with our natural states, even if we live in an urban environment. We look at things such as lighting, how we sit and what we eat. He explains how many of our habits are biologically extreme, but socially normal. He shares how fatherhood has inspired him to connect more with himself and nature and how it has opened up his explorations into the role of the masculine at this time. I hope that you enjoy this interview. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity and sustainability. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. I'm delighted today to be joined by Tony Riddle, who is the natural lifestylist. A coach and an expert in all of these incredible ways that we can bring more of nature and into our lifestyles, into our homes, into the way that we live our lives, whether we live in the city or we live in a forest. They're just uh, amazing, amazing tools and practices. And uh, Tony, when we first met, which was in your workshop at Yoga Connects, I was doing a workshop there too, and my friend was like, we've got to go to this one. And I loved it because your kids did most of the workshop for you. They did, yeah. They were the examples of the biological norm, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> so they're very knowledgeable, your daughters. Yeah. Um, and I, I found that your language was really helpful because there are loads of things that, you know, I've been thinking about or doing or trying to explain to people and often it sounds like this sort of hippie alternative thing. And when you explained it and you talked about this concept of something being biologically extreme but socially normal or um, socially normal but biologically extreme, I've just said them, have I said them the same way? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. But or biologically you, normal but socially extreme, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So when you talked about that, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I just loved that language. Where where did that language come from? Like when, when did you kind of realise that that was what was happening? Um, from the need to explain it simply, that's yeah. where it came from. Because I find that, you know, it, it comes under the same umbrella as rewilding, you know? But most people you approach with rewilding, they think hippie, tree-hugging, squatting naked in nature. And that's kind of the feedback or the, the wall that gets built whenever I mention rewilding or they can't pronounce it, or something comes up. And so, and I didn't like hacking either. I just, I think hacks are just, I think it's really negative, that term hack. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I just found that we were kind of traversing between wanting to live in nature and my business being in the city. And then seeing most of these guys come in from the city. So they can't relate to rewilding. They're so far removed from it. So I start talking about hunter-gatherers, let's say, and how they're, or our ancestral health, and they just don't get it. They're not, they're just, it, it doesn't mean anything. They can't relate to it. They're so far disconnected from what hunter-gatherer is. And so are we all, right? I mean, I can live with a hunter-gatherer for the rest of my life. I love all the technological advances I've made, you know, as a human being. And I can see how we can just evolve and the world can become a better place through that. So how do we communicate that? And it was really just, initially it was um, ancestral health is modern wealth, you know, for me. That's the way I looked at it. And I could bring as much of that ancestral benefits into the urban jungle. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do I look at that, right? At the moment, where, where are we at as a society? What's been normalized? 
and then normalized came up. Okay, so that's normal. What's the normal? Oh, it's the social norm. So what are the social norms of today? And the social norms, unfortunately, are biologically extreme. So we've developed a lighting system that basically brings sunrise into sunset, you know, which is insane, but we can all relate to birds chirping at night because of the lighting system. So we say, oh, listen to the birds out there right now. Look, they all think it's daytime. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting indoors with exactly the same lighting system on, awake, mm -hmm. past 10 p.m. at night when we should be asleep. Well, it's know? great because it means we can work for exactly. 21 work. hours a day. And that's what we've normalized, you see. And, yeah. and, then we're, and in a way, it's dishonoring the biological norm. What is our biological norm? So then we have to look to ancient systems to be able to understand what that is before all the social norms have been put in place, you mm. know? And that's, that's kind of where that came from for me. Mm. And it's a long journey that. So I, I was involved with a company called Wild Fitness and Wild Fitness had this term, um, remove a human animal from its natural habitat and it will suffer physically, socially, spiritually. Return it back to its natural habitat and it will heal physically, socially, spiritually, right? So that was, that was, again, it's about, oh, okay, we rewild them. So that's great. So we can take these guys from the city and we can put them into nature. And that was great. And they had rewilding retreats. And I loved the, and I loved the concept, but it fell down for me because once they finished their retreat in this biologically normal setting, they then return back to the city. And then what? And then you're faced with exactly the same saboteurs from your socially normal existence that put you in the biologically extreme position that you needed to go on a biologically normal retreat. And so my retreats then turned into um, the knowledge that, you know, what, what do you need? What, what skill sets can you go home with? And then that then evolved into when you are at home, when you return home, I will meet you in your home. And we will then look at your setup in your home. So then how you eat, how you sleep, how you move in that environment, you know, and then it could come down to the sense of community, you know, which is, I think, a big one, really, within that. And then exploring what social norm is, it's basically community. You mm -hmm. know, that's where it really lies. So whatever tribe that you're born into, and I'll call them the tribe, let's call it community that you're born into, it exists of your family, your friends, your loved ones, let's say. Um, that's your tribe of influence. So they influence how you play out the rest of your life physically and spiritually and all-encompassing emotionally. And so that's where the real social norms are. So for me it was like, how do we look at that? So for pet, becoming a parent is probably the biggest change within that. So me wanting to be the better biological normal male within that, in that, that home environment, let's say. Especially having three daughters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Off on a tangent there, but that's that's kind of the foundations are becoming a papa, you know, and working with retreats and 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 seeing what benefits that for people to turn up on a retreat who are suffering from all the conditions of living in what would be the human zoo, let's say, you know, the compromised sleep patterns, the adrenal systems, the emotions that come with it, and a lot of women, and that was the really interesting thing, mm. you know, yeah. I mean, it's just it's so interesting because I have, I guess I've been doing things to make my space uh, a sanctuary kind of naturally for years and then I do do a lot of research into kind of different things, you know, have a lot, there's lots of chemicals I don't like to have in my house and all kinds of things. And um, I had an experience recently where I moved into a co-living space for work and the building was set up in a way that literally it shook my system like mm. so much and it's funny because I don't have this like if I have to go and stay in a hotel or so, I'm not like a super fussy person that like can't cope in like lots of different situations I, I'm a traveler and adventurer so, you know yeah, yeah. I not can, like you're I precious adapt, you know you can adapt yeah but this building it had a um, strip blue lighting in all the corridors that was automatic and every room, every communal room had like automatic lights that, that go on and they're a certain brightness no matter what time of the day and there was no way of adjusting it. And in the bedrooms there were no, um, the lights were it was like six bulbs when you turn the lights, it's so bright. And I actually got insomnia for the first mm. time ever and I started to feel quite out of my body. Yeah, yeah. It, and it really showed me the power of 
okay, like, these things make such a difference. And it also showed me how behind we are in a lot of this, the, the practical application of a lot of this information. Even just thinking when I was um, in this tech startup incubator with a project, they had like that blue light strips in the, in the office and we were often in there until two, three in the morning because it's like tech startup culture and, <laughs> and then we were back in there at seven and literally, you know, we did all start to lose it a bit. I'm sure, it's like <laughs> a sleep deprivation experiment. But also being in that light for all those hours yeah. that's the same and that's really bright. And so that's a really nice place to start. Could you explain a bit about lighting and how it affects our bodies? Yeah, so I think the original um, understanding of circadian rhythms came with plants, right? So they would, rather than in light, they put them in darkness and then figure out that they had a cycle. Whereas you can't figure it out in light because light just means that you, in that office environment, would be awake for all those hours because you're stimulated. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you put you into darkness, then you can see, like a blind person, for instance, has this cycle, they have a proper cycle, and it can be 25 hours, not 24, which is another conversation. But they, they also have um, the highest levels of melatonin production. So blind people have up to 11 hours of melatonin production. Um, whereas a night shift worker, for instance, have really low levels of melatonin. Right? And then when you really expand on that, you can then look at... What is melatonin? So melatonin, it's not, it's associated with being a sleep hormone. It's not a sleep hormone. It doesn't put you to sleep. It has many different roles. And some of those roles are the clean up, to clean up your cells. So it stops the proliferation of cancer. So cancer is a big one, right? So we then look at these two groups and we can say, where's cancer with the blind people who have like 11 hours of melatonin versus the night shift worker? So nurses and night shift workers have 50% higher rates of breast cancer and prostate cancer, right? Wow. And blind people over here have much, much reduced, I think 35 to 50 percent less risk of breast and prostate cancer. Right? So that's one element of looking at it. Mm. So what tends to happen is the at night when we go into darkness or we have amber tones, so it could be firelight or um, candlelight, you're using candlelight or a salt lamp, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So at that frequency of light, which is amber tones, it's not daylight. Okay, so it's equivalent to being darkness. So you could be either in a dark room or an amber lit room, or what's now available is like amber glasses, or we have lighting systems that can switch to amber, right? The touch of a button, you can go, ah, it's, it's firelight now, or candlelight, mm -hmm. before the light bulb was invented in what, 1879, right? So before the light bulb came along, boom, everyone was sleeping, let's say, right? So I can, I can, I can bring that back. And if I turn my blue light on, blue or green spectrum light on, boom, I go back to daylight again. And the moment daylight comes on, through my pineal gland, it triggers my brain to understand, hang on a minute, it's daylight. And then through daylight, I then cut out melatonin. So my melatonin gets dumped out of the system. So I now no longer have the benefits of melatonin helping my sleep or the clean up operation of my cells. Mm -hmm. And then it will also affect metabolism. So studies around where that goes with cancer, where it goes with metabolism. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's vast. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's probably a, a whole podcast just on sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Huge. But there's some great stuff out there. There's some great books I recommend. Um, 21 Steps to Sleeping Smarter, which is Sean Stevenson. That's great. And he's kind of, his role was to make sleep sexy, which is quite cool, you know? And then you look at room temperature and um, trying to get the temperature down because, of course, at night, without firelight and without candlelight or any form of flame, it would be cooler for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're just trying to mimic what would be in nature. And you know, we're sat in in my um, flat in Hackney. Yes. And I know one of the things that you look at is kind of tips for the home. So we're sitting on the floor, we which are. I do most of the time. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I got a really nice looking but uncomfortable sofa. So mm -hmm. when I'm on the sofa, it's very upright. And then most yeah. of the time I lounge on the floor or kind of do my thing on the floor. Why, um, why is that beneficial to the body? Oh, this is huge. Right, so... Um, <clears throat> When did the chair come along, let's say, in our evolution, right? Um, so, pre-chairs, 
and look at cultures that have no chairs. So let's look at tribes that don't use chairs. There's studies that show they have around about 100 different rest positions they use on the ground. So why then break this down into looking at what's, um, say, a macro skill is, say, the macro skill of standing alone. And there's these little micro movements that go into that macro position. And having three kids, I've got to observe all of this. So our first one we kind of had we still lived in the environment of having car seats, let's say, and we had um, a high chair, although she was carried around in a sling. Okay? Mm -hmm. Second one came along and we, had, we didn't have a car, um, we had a sling, and we still had trip trap chairs. And then when Millie turned two, I just said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I was watching their postures just start to collapse and collapse and collapse instead of being these amazing upright beings. And I knew so much from coaching posture, which I'm going to get to now, but I, I just through that observation alone, I said, right, that's it, no sofa, I'm going to... Uh, so I had this video of me soaring up my sofa at home, you know. <laughs> no sofa, no sitting in the home. And so that went, and then Tallulah came along, our third child, so she had no um, car seat, no stroller, no chair, no sofa, no trip trap chair, and was just basically brought up in a sling, carried everywhere or on the ground, and you suddenly see, wow, this is different. There's, men, there's multiple motor skill milestones, but the ones that are recorded, the motor skills milestones that we see these charts, they're really recorded in the zoo. So they're in the biologically extreme, socially normal behaviors. Whereas if you look at, wow, what's the biological normal way of moving on the ground? And you see so many different micronutrients going into that posture, into the standing posture and then how capable she becomes. So Tallulah was already standing at like nine months, but strong standing, wasn't like wobbly on her feet, her walking started, she'd become very capable as a human being, you know. And then that's just the experience of it, and then the, the real intellectual stuff is very different. It's, you know, we're not designed to sit in chairs, it causes stagnation, it stagnates the hips, the ankles, and all the areas that are designed for movement. And then if I then take the chair away and I keep returning back to the ground, I get all these deep knee bends and I mobilize the hips and all the joints and I suddenly start to become more compliant because the ground is hard. So because the ground is hard, I need to understand how to be soft. Mm. So I don't have a flexibility routine, I just live on the ground because living on the ground nurtures all my joints and my muscle and tendon actions. And then those muscle and tendon actions are then appropriate to feed the correct standing posture. And then when I stand correctly, that means I can walk correctly, I can run correctly, I can jump correctly. So out of all the multiple disciplines the human animal has, and there's, I mean, we're incredible beings, we can mimic any other animal that's on the planet. So we have this ability, yet we put ourselves in a prison, which is the chair, that takes away all the, all the abilities of that, you know, it's, does that make sense? So, yeah, um, totally. So witnessing that with Tallulah was just, it was quite profound for me because I had all the textbook knowledge, but to actually see it unravel that way and for her to be just a really capable human, you know, strong and yeah, blew me away actually. So yeah, I think if you're going to sit down in a chair for most office people, what they're in a chair for eight to 10 hours a day, let's say. Yeah, maybe more, maybe, maybe on their more, commute as well. You know? and and when they're in a rush. On the sofa. And they're in a rush on the commute. So I used to commute in from Windsor into London. And I used to video it. So I used to do a rewild your commute. So I'd basically squat on the, in the carriage or I'd hang off the bars, you know. <laughs> but I'd also witnessed these people that were in like this crazy rush. I talk about community. There is no community on a commute, right? You can take away community completely from that. It's like this one man thing. I've got to get to a chair, right? I need to get to that chair, I've paid for that ticket, I need to sit down, I'm going to sit down in that chair and then I'm going to get to my office and I'm going to sit down again. And we just starve ourselves of all this amazing movement throughout the day. And then we put exercise into this small little window of an hour. But where does all that start, right? So it has to start somewhere. And for me it just starts at school. So you go into, for me I went into a school environment and I went from a kid that was playing around constantly in nature to sitting in a chair with a hierarchical system of a teacher at the front, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then when we were allowed out, you're not allowed to run in the corridor. So that running was taken out, right? And I'm this free animal used to running around. So I'm now imprisoned within this environment. And then, 
we're allowed out for one hour of play. So you have one hour of play. Ah, what is play? Play is like, ah, oh, I'm allowed to the gym for an hour, right? So that's where that kind of foundation is. That becomes play, and then over time, that's removed, and it just becomes a lunch break. And then we're given a very specialist subject called phys physical education. So mm -hmm. physical education then takes away play from the playground. So there is no play anymore. What we've done is removed play from the human as well. And we're, you know, we're an animal. Animals love playing, right? So we remove that and we create a very specialist subject called physical education that is specialist. And you and I are generalists, right? We are these amazing generalist animals that I say can impersonate any other creature. Mm -hmm. So I like to look at us and think we have a YouTube sensation sitting in all of us. These mm -hmm. amazing kids, these parkour kids you see jumping off and leaping off and balancing off things. We all have that. It's just the tribe of influence hasn't enabled it to expose it. And so within the, within the classroom model, sorry, I'll go back to that, um, that specialist model removes the generalist from you and then we create a negative connotation towards exercise because not all kids are specialists at football, rugby, tennis and their movement patterns that are repetitive over and over again and then we take that movement and we put it back into the chair immediately afterwards so we create this lovely movement pattern and then we go boom there's a chair again so that for me felt eventually like a, ch a jelly mold in my mind that we'd, we'd have this runny jelly and then we'd set it in the fridge so then we then start to shape, that's, that's our rest position. So you go and do physical education, and then we program in that sitting is resting, mm -hmm. you know? So we work in that position, then we consider it a rest position. And then we return to our homes, and of course the most favourite activity of most people these days is to sit on the couch and they maybe watch a bit of TV, you know? I know I had that experience when I was a child, so, you know? So I can... I relate to it in that sense, but also understand now it's, it is really biologically extreme to just remove all the movement capabilities of, of that human. You know. Are they easy to reawaken? Yeah, I mean, I, I have clients that have come to me in their 70s, you know, and, and I first look at the way they just move, so it could be just analyze, I analyze the macro skill of, say, walking. And then you can see from walking, ah, okay, this segment's out, this segment's out. So how do I look at that? How do I address that? Right, let's take them right back into just lying on the ground, like the very first mic, um, motor skill of just lying down and understanding gravity. So they might just have to lift the weight of their head and get used to lifting seven kilograms, 6.5 kilograms off the floor. And then feeling what, that, what the experience of that is on other areas of their body where they recognise there's a, a shift of gravity and where they recognise the body weight and where gravity's become tangible. Once that happens, I realise I have to use muscles again. Okay, so that, that activates this and they start to programme in that way. And then I go from lying patterns to rolling patterns on the floor. And then from rolling patterns then into resting into kneeling. And then from kneeling into just gentle locomotive patterns like crawling. Mm -hmm. And then crawling will just act, it starts the little activations of the ankles, the knees and the hips and understanding the spine and then squatting eventually. And like the squat then is the prize really we look at because we have to squat before we stand, mm -hmm. you know? And then always being able to get back to a squat because if squatting is the foundation of standing, if you can't squat, should you be standing? And the chair is like an anti-squat, do you understand? Because it just stops us short at one hip level and that's it, mm. yeah. Yeah, when I'm in like my most powerful daily routine, I say that my daily routine, like it, it might when I'm kind of feeling a bit overwhelmed, it sort of gets shorter. But when I'm in that place yeah, where yeah. I'm, my full attention is in it, in one of the things that I like to do is uh, squat and drink my kind of hot lemon water yeah. whilst I'm squatting, and just kind of allows my bowels and everything to just sort of yeah, feel really nourished and hydrated and yeah. get all the movement going. Exactly. Um, what else is there in the house that is a, a kind of useful thing to... Well, it's returning to the ground is probably it's re one of the beneficial ones. Lighting and then introducing candlelight. You know, and if you're not happy about burning candles in the home, there, as I say, there's, there's lots of lighting systems out there now. You know, hue lighting by Philips is one system. Um, and they're just a pack and a hub and it connects to your router. And with your mobile phone, you can adjust your own lighting in all your rooms, yeah. um, except it's Wi-Fi. And I just didn't like the idea of having Wi-Fi running through every bedroom. So there's, um, there's another 
bulb by Aura Glow, and it just uh, cheap as anything. They just they screw in. You have a remote control, and you can change them. Um, plants, so plants for air purification. Um, and then if you're not going to be great with plants and you think you're killing them off and energetically, I don't think that's that great. So you can go for air purification systems. And there's one, um, Blue Air, that's one product. Um, and they strip so many particles out and he gives you a reading as well. Dyson are going into wellness in the home, which is quite powerful now. So I think they might be looking at lighting. I think that's going to be something they might be looking at. It's a bit hush hush, hush I think. Um, and then not anymore. Not now anymore. everyone and then knows. Air purification. <laughs> so air purification, I think, is going to be. Yeah, I think we're going to hear a lot more of that. But their air purification systems are great. Mm -hmm. um, if you like that kind of design, they look like a big speaker system, you know, in a way. But again, it will give you a readout, and it's the harmful pollutants in the air in the home. Which we do, we do, we don't even really understand that yet. I mean, there's so much involved with sorting out air pollution outside, but we don't really think about what's going on in the home. So from your paint, from the plastics, the mastics, you know, your furnishing, benzene, xylene, formaldehyde, all that stuff, neurotoxins that we're breathing in. Yeah. We, we need to start looking at that. And then it could be toxic molds. That's another way of approaching that. But I would look at that because you know how you're feeling with the co-living, co-working, co-living, co-living co space, yeah. you know, in the workplace, we're there for, say, eight to ten hours. And if we break our diary down, right, so let's say we have 24 hours in a day, don't we? Right? Yeah. So let's say we're lucky enough to experience eight hours sleep, really deep, nourishing sleep. Although most of us don't. But where is that eight hours of nourishing sleep? It should be in a nourishing environment, right? But for most, it's not. So we're sleeping on mattresses. We don't have no understanding what's in them. We just buy them, right? Mm -hmm. And then the bedding can be the same thing. So what's the quality of the fabrics you're sleeping in? Um, is it carpeted? What's, the, what's in the carpet? What's underneath the carpet? What's the underlay of the carpet? I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's not really, because it's, it's a third of your life you're spending in that room. You need to pay attention to it, you know? Mm. And so for me, bedrooms, yeah. So plants in the bedroom, lighting systems in the bedroom, air purification system in the bedroom. You know, and then there's a pricing scale to that, right? Because it's you know some of it can be. Hang on a minute, you know, you're talking about spending this. So plants, peace lilies, peace lilies for me. If you put five peace lilies in a bedroom, you're done. I mean, they're 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 incredible plants, and they're also really simple to keep. So yeah. you can they go away for two alive. weeks, and you'll come back, and they're still not drooping. And if they are drooping, they come to life just like that. So yeah. you just feed the bottom of the pot, and then they they suck up what they need, and they're away. It's a really simple, simple one. It's interesting because, you know, my background's in sustainable fashion, so yeah. I've thought a lot about fabric and yeah. um, you know, my sheets. Um, I do buy organic cotton, tend to buy white so that they don't have, like, the dyes in them. Exactly. Um, but I didn't, I never thought about my mattress. No, pillows, mattress. Yeah. It's all there. And also, like, I've never really thought about you know, this rug that we're sitting on. Yeah. But I don't know if I'd even know how to make sure that my rug, where to get a rug that doesn't have any well, this is the thing. nasty chemicals from. This is the thing that you, it's, if it's in your home already, are you going to throw it away? It's like I, I'm plant based, right? Yeah. But I haven't thrown away all my leather goods because I just feel it would be really disrespectful to throw all that stuff away, right? So, and some things I've been given, given as gifts, and I just feel. It's energetically, it doesn't feel great to me to go and do it. So I feel it's probably the same within the home, you know, but when you come to replace things, that's really what you need to look at. So the other way of looking around that is to look at plants and I say air purification systems. And that's, that's just a different approach. And anything you do buy in the future, then you can look at your labeling and look at what you're purchasing, mm -hmm. you know? I, I have seen that there are wool mattresses. Yeah, there's bamboo. Um, yeah, and there's, yeah, you can, you can find it. You know, this is just a bit of research again, isn't it? Yeah. And On our favourite system called Google, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> if in doubt. So talking about Google, you mentioned about Wi-Fi. Um, do you have Wi-Fi in your home? In, we lived in Ibiza for a year without Wi-Fi. Amazing. Really amazing. Because we were on like, we had, I mean, it, was a, it was a really old, old thinker, so it's a proper old farm with lots of land and um, just, the kids were just, we wanted it because basically you can go and live in Ibiza and you can have a biologically extreme experience or a biologically normal experience, right? It's just, that's the kind of island. 
but everyone is looking for freedom just the same, right? So it's one of those environments that we just felt the kids can have freedom, but it felt secure at the same time. It's that, it gives you, gives you that real potent feeling of that. And live a biologically normal existence without raising socially extreme eyebrows. Mm -hmm. So I could drive in my car naked to the beach, get out the car, swim naked, get back in the car, drive home. You know, it's just, it's that, to that level, it's okay there, you know, nobody even cares. Um, there's areas that would care, but there, you can yeah. do that in certain areas on the island, which I found incredible. Um, so what, yeah, for, so with Wi-Fi, we just, we just existed without it. We just feel, didn't feel that we could bring that into that environment. Whereas we've moved now, temporarily, um, closer to a beach, because we're coming back to the UK for six months, so it's like a short-term place we could go into. And it's a very different experience. It's like a, it's, it's a duplex and it's on the beach and it just, it's, it feels like being on holiday. I couldn't live there permanently, but it feels like it's, a, it's kind of like, ah, uh, there's heating. And you can understand, like, it's, it's the life of inconvenience of the farm. It's a lot of work. And it really opens your eyes up to, oh, wow, you, re you have to work at this existence over here, right? It's so easy to have Wi-Fi and have everything at the touch of it, you know, touch mm -hmm. of a button. And you get, you get, now we get to see that. Like the kids are suddenly, you know, they want to watch, they want to watch something on an iPad because we have Wi-Fi, whereas it wasn't even mentioned over here, mm. you know? And it just, it changes everything. Well, I mean, we're, we're the same when we're adults. Like, I don't have a TV in this room because we if don't have I did, TV. I would want to watch it. Yeah, yeah. It's simple as I would come yeah. home, sofa TV. It's a companion, There's, right? And it also represents, a it's like a fire. So it's like having a fire in your room. Right? Yeah. It's another artificial sun. And if you're on your own, it's a companion, you know? People put a TV on, just have it on in the background, you know? Just, yeah. yeah, yeah. But if it's not in the room, I yeah. never come home and think, oh, I wish there was a TV in here. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Not once thought that. Yeah, yeah. But with Wi-Fi, I mean, it's interesting, because I, um, you know, I have like, so I have one of those stickers on the Wi-Fi to kind of lower the EMFs. And um, I would be turning it off at night, but now it is connected to the thermostat. But then, because I'm in a, a block of flats, exactly, I was going to go there. A whole bunch you know of what? other people's I don't think you, I don't think you stand a chance because you're just surrounded. By, if you live in a city, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The difference is we could have Wi-Fi off in this place that we're staying in, where we've moved to. But what's the point? Because everyone around us is is in that position, you know. But I think you can remove certain aspects of it. You know, if you have to have yours on for your heating system, you have to have it on. I mean, you're done, right? But I wouldn't go and buy light bulbs or Wi-Fi system to have it on because I can choose an alternative of that, mm -hmm. you know? But what about if you Whereas are... it's quite a smart heating, I think you probably have, right? Um, yeah, and it was also just because of the, the system. Yeah, it was for smart energy, and it was also because yeah. that, that boiler was quite old and um, didn't have a thermostat system with it. So in order to regulate the temperature, that was the only way to do it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's interesting because, you know, here there are a less Wi-Fi rays, but for example, in that co-living building, there were, every individual studio had its own Wi-Fi and there were 540 studios in the building. So there's, a lot of Wi-Fi going yeah, yeah. through as well. Really potent. Is there any? Do the peace lilies help with this as well? I don't think. Yeah, you know, to that degree, how are they going to help with that? I mean, that's that's pretty. That's probably why you're feeling so trash going in there, right? Yeah. Not just the lighting. Yeah, I think it's a combination of the, it. Was a real example for me. It's a real of, electromagnetic chaos going on. Yeah. I had it. We we I had a gym in um, West Hampstead. It's an old railway building, um, so it's right on the tube line. <clears throat> and the tubes used to thunder past the windows. And if I, if I could be coaching in there sometimes, well, it might be a 10 hour day. And I was kind of, I feel really sick. Like, and it was, it would, it would be, I, I could do three, four, three, four days, come the fifth day, that was it, I was, I was completely wiped out. And I think my turning point, I was, have, I was holding a presentation, a room full of personal trainers that had come in to see me. And it was, again, teaching a philosophy of natural living in this building with tube trains going past. And it just thundered all the doors. And I was, it was in that moment, I was feeling really sick because of it. 
it was just, it was it, it, was, it that was it. I had to close the gym at that moment. That mm -hmm. was my turning point. I'm done, I'm a fraud. I'm standing in this railroad building with chaos all around me and I'm presenting this model on natural living, you know? So yeah, I don't think, um, I don't think you, could, you can be around that, that energy for too long. And if, if you are, or if you do p feel particularly frazzled, what, what do you recommend to kind of reground? What do I do for grounding? Yeah. Yeah, because I have this, you know, because I, I don't let's not forget I'm flying a lot, right? So I fly from London to Ibiza, Ibiza to London. I do, I do two flights a week, pretty much, right? And so I get the build up again. It hits me on, I think it's the fourth week, and it's around about moon phases as well that I suddenly just feel just, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Um, and so I do a lot of breath work and also food types. So I'm learning more and more about that now. Um, so I like to live like a plant-based lifestyle. Um, but then you still need grounding foods at the same time, you know? Like the feeling of stews and things like that, that I feel I need to get on board. So um, yeah, I work a lot with breath work. Um, meditation helps, of course, for grounding. But also, um, I spend a lot of my life barefoot, mm -hmm. you know? or I wear barefoot technology, but being barefoot's the best thing really, and get out to a local park or just find some green space and connect with it, just take your shoes and socks off and have a walk around in nature. That could be a local park in the middle of a city, you know, or just sit under a tree or do, do, do something, find a way of grounding, getting back to some kind of natural habitat or something that you can recognize at least as nature. You know, that's, you know that helps. Yeah. So for me, breath work, food, um, and also switching s your own device off, you know. So we've lost the ability to rest in a sense, haven't we? You know, if I if I picture my father working and working and working, he'd he'd always rest. He'd still be resting. He'd have like time in his armchair to just mm -hmm. zone out. And I'm just resting my eyes, but he's actually asleep, right? <laughs> but he'd have that time, and not many people have that now. You know, in their rest, they're on Instagram or they're on Facebook or they're emailing. There is, we've taken that out. So that's also, I think, finding those moments in the day, which are me moments. That's that's my time now, and that's grounding. You know, mm. yeah. You mentioned that your diet's mostly plant-based. Yeah. Uh, why? Why is it? Mine is too, but I, it's nice to hear. I have, there's, there's, three, <laughs> there's always three arenas I work in, right? Yeah. So I have a physical, a social, and a spiritual. So physically, I had a condition called psoriasis. And, um, and it was kind of part of that template of feeling a fraud being in this gym, standing there. I had a skin condition. So it's an autoimmune disease, I can't really do much about it, but it was just, for me, it just... It was just the symbol of not being healthy, right? Even though I felt like I was doing everything I could physically. But I was kind of into the wild sense, the paleo primal stuff. So I was eating meats, basically, and not really giving much care to what the meats were, you know? So I, I had a friend who had MS, um, multiple sclerosis, and he, which is another autoimmune disease. And somehow on my radar came up this lady called Terry Wall of the Walls Protocol. And it was a, it was a TED talk of hers. So she's there presenting a TED talk standing up, clicking, clicking through slides. And one of the slides is her in a wheelchair, um, you know, an electronic wheelchair, crippled by MS basically. And then her story was this, that she wasn't going to let it beat her. She was on meds and then she'd feel better and then she'd have an episode again. And the idea was that she, in, on the journey was she suddenly found how to supplement and she was supplementing to help her health and she studied cellular biology and she discovered exactly what cells need so we're talking about the physical sense now what cells need for their survival and we're a petri dish of however many trillion cells right and bacteria and so to feed the cells themselves she discovered this specific diet so in there was now this conversation around grass-fed to grass slaughter animals, no grain-fed animals. And then you start to break that down, you realize that what she's actually talking about is hunter-gatherers, or from where my perspective, I was looking at primal paleo, 
Paleolithic man wasn't going around hunting domesticated, antibiotic, grain-fed animals. He was eating wild animals, and he was also honouring the wild animal. Yeah? So every part of that animal would go, and they'd, it would be a, a ceremony and a celebration. And so energetically, it was an exchange as well. There's a spiritual component to it, right? And then social knowledge of that. So for me, I then, I just then, I can't eat domesticated animals anymore. You know, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I can't eat grain-fed animals because it's compromising my own cells. So then you start to look at, well, okay, what's the spiritual aspects of that? And then I, you know, along my journeys, I've done plant medicines and, and, I, and I was on a San Pedro ceremony. And San Pedro is another plant medicine. They call it the uncle. And it kind of taps you on the shoulder and gives you gentle advice in your ear. And I was on this ceremony, and there was a hare, like a, you know, like a, a hare, a live hare, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which I didn't realize was live because it was, just, it was so close to me, it wasn't moving. But I was so tuned into this hare, like on the right frequency of this hare, that um, it just said, it's okay to eat my um, brothers and sisters, but it's not okay to put all their information up on social media. And what, what I basically did is, on, a, on my path of thinking I needed to eat wild animals, I, I, I caught this hare and I basically took out its liver and its heart and I was so just blown away by the size of these internal organs that I had to post it up and explain to the world what it was. And then I, I suddenly tuned into the, just the spiritual animal itself, you know, in that moment. And then I just thought, you know, I can't, I can't, I just can't, how can I eat this thing, you know, how can I eat a hare, you know, and then we had this kind of moment, this conversation. And later on in the day, I then went into the woods with this ceremony. You kind of move around with it. And I find myself up in the trees. I just, I needed to climb the trees, so I climb up in the tree. Um, have you ever read Danny, the Champion of the World? Yeah. Roald Dahl. You know, with the pheasants, and the pheasants at night will roost. They go into the trees, right? They never stay on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I'm there in, in the woods, and I'm sitting in this tree, and suddenly I could hear all these, and all these birds all around me like pheasants all around me in the trees, right? And they've gone up to roost, but I'm just, I'm now an animal in the tree. I realize I've tuned into the frequency of the woods. I'm not a human, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, a human, a modern human sitting in that tree. I'm now an animal on that frequency. So yeah. all these pheasants are quite happy with me being there. But then the moment I congratulated myself about being in the trees, didn't say a word, did not move. I just went, oh my God, this is amazing, in my head. They all just went, and off they went. Wow. So I, I, just, I just had to then, it just made sense to me that I couldn't really, um, I couldn't start consuming too many animals, you know. But at the same time, I then realized there's, there's a whole evolutionary system there because I've studied a lot of it and I present a lot of this stuff and you know so we were <clears throat> say primates for a period of time we still are a primate but let's say we had our primate existence as an ape right and then we then turned into a hominid bipedal ape and then we had hunter-gatherer period of time then we had a farming period of time and then we have a modern period of time through our nutrition so our longest standing diet is right over here as a primate and our closest cousins are, say, chimpanzee and the bonobo. But they're not vegan. They're not, they're not completely vegan. They still hunt. They have this, they're called, they're basically there's a great book called Hunting Apes, and it talks about the whole social order of the apes hunting. And so they have 5% animal protein. They're not completely vegan. So I do some, I switch, I go through this plant-based phase, and then sometimes I just feel part of that grounding I feel it must be, is I think, oh, you know, I've, I just feel like I've got to have something. And um, I'll, I'll have a bit of wild meat, but, I, I, but there's a whole, it's, again, it's a real mindful eating process for me. It's not um, supporting what I feel is a domesticated, harmful experience for animals. Mm. You know that on a spiritual level, they're not healthy, physically they're not healthy, and socially, what, what message are we giving out to the world that it's okay to do that to another animal? So that doesn't work for me, you know. And that goes for dairy and everything else. I think dairy is probably almost worse, you know, that we're doing this crazy stuff to animals to take away their kids so we can have their milk, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's horrible. The dairy story is like... Yeah, I mean, it's nuts. What, I mean, what are we thinking? You know, it's, oh, we can just go and do this stuff. 
and steamroll the planet as we go and do it, you know. So that that kind of came through a bit later in my journey, really, through, I think, more of a, through my tribe of influence. You know, I was talking about the tribe of influence. I did so much work in the physical self over here, and it's kind of, oh, and it's very, it's quite a masculine model I'd developed over here. And then when my gym closed, and my whole world just went, and I kind of had a bit of a breakdown to have a breakthrough in that sense. It's not a breakdown, it's, you know, it's just a dip in an ice cold bucket and pull back out again, realizing mm -hmm. that, hang on, this isn't working for me. And so I found a whole new tribe of influence, and with that came more of a spiritual, spiritual stroll in the park rather than just the physical, I've got my shoes off. This was more like, ah, uh, I've got my shoes off, you know, that mm -hmm. feeling, yeah. And with the, with the plant-based diet, do you have any kind of tips into how you stay healthy, healthy and, and nourished? Because I know <coughs> for me, I've been I was a, I, you know I've been a vegetarian most of my life, apart from that brief period between the age of eleven and twenty five <laughs> when I totally rebelled <laughs> against my upbringing. Um, uh, thanks to a triple dare with a cherry on the top in a, in a well-known fast food burger joint. Mm. <laughs> and um, I have definitely gone through periods where my health has um, taken a dip. And I found that that is generally when I eat out a lot and yeah. Yeah. I'm unprepared and therefore, um, especially with being vegetarian, not vegan, it can be quite like... If you're if you're caught out, you, cheese sandwiches, cheesy pasta like that is sort of all you get in places. Uh, what are your ways of making sure that your diet stays nutritious? Um, firstly, I think fasting is a really, really important tool. Um, not just the physiological be benefits and dumping toxins out, but for the emotional attachment to food. So most of us feel like we're starving when we're walking around, and we're not. We're just taking an emotional dip from the highs that we're getting from the food groups we're eating. So we're not hungry. We're just emotionally hungry for the food. So if you fast, you'll be amazed at how long you can go about food. Like I, I, I teach this a lot to my clients that fly long haul because all the saboteurs are there in the airport, and they will crave the most ridiculous food. So they start stuffing this stuff, right? And, and then they beat themselves up on the flight the whole time, and then they start ordering stuff on the flight again. You'll be amazed what people can order on a flight, you know, heated plastics and God knows what else, but they happily eat it. Um, so fasting really helps with that. It just suddenly just drops out the emotional attachment to the food, and that most of those foods are gonna be your sugars and your carbohydrates that you're taking a huge peak with and then crashing, right? And it's in those crashing moments that you're vulnerable as a consumer. Um, so fasting is one way. Um, I then, I don't really, advise, I'm not keen on grains, I just, um, yeah, just, it's the phytates in a lot of things as well, so we soak a lot, so we have pseudo grains, so like buckwheat, um, we have a bit of quinoa every now and then, but again I reduce that down, I have it like twice a week, just by looking at the Wolves Protocol, you know, although she recommends like, you know, grass fed, grass sort of meats, there's also, there is a kind of plant based aspect to it, where it's just looking at all the vegetables, all the colours of them, and don't get stuck into um, the poor version of veganism or vegetarianism, you know, where we start eating just beans and rice and pasta, right? Because there isn't much nutrients in, in any of that, and it will starve you of nutrients at the same time, and it can compromise your gut. And unless you're soaking a lot of these things, you're not really activating the enzymes in them. So we can be, you know, you can have an amazing diet, you can have an, an, an incredibly diet, but if you're not absorbing any of it, it just goes straight in the toilet. There's no point in doing it. So really it's about how do we activate the foods as well. And then you need to eat less because you're activating it, you know. So if you lose the emotional attachment to the food, that's the first starting point. And then you make sure that what you're eating is just really high quality nutrients and then those nutrients you know are being fed but it's how do they get fed so there's another aspect that we haven't really discussed which is the digestive system which is going to be about bacteria so you have this whole army and a whole organism there that is like the feeding system for yourselves so food goes in and then that decides where it's going to go and distributes it in a way does that make sense so really it's about honoring that as well so just creating a really healthy gut which is a nice word nice nice um 
explanation of that is from Robin Shukan. She called it a gut garden. You know, you have to go grow a gut garden, and that's that's where I'm at with that really. Mm, so look after that way. system. So look after the gut, and then deal with the emotional element with eating. So there's there's good ways of looking at the emotional attachment to eating, which is, you know, trust the gut and trust the heart. I need this food group, but at the same time. We're also domesticated. We haven't got a clue anymore, right? Whereas if you look at someone maybe who lives completely at one with nature, um, Bruce Parry talked about this, about this tribe that he went to visit, and they are literally, they are the forest. They're, they are nature themselves. They're not separate. And I honestly believe that we have a self-medicating ability, but we're just so out of touch with it. So you know you could you know you can rewild it in by fasting for long periods of time, and then suddenly you're the smells and the senses, you know what your organism needs. And what's a safe way to start fasting if, if it's new to somebody? Um, I will start people at night, so I say, well, have a last meal at, say, 6 p.m. And then the next day, just water, or you could do green juicing, or just, yeah, and just and go all the way through till 6 p.m. in the evening, because most the bulk of it's done through the night anyway for your sleep, and it's much easier. Or just start you know, interval fasting, do 12 hour, 18 hour fast and have a play with it and just see how you feel. Because it has to be about getting, you know, you, you basically need to alter the state that you're operating at emotionally with the food and also deal with the physiology because you might just be crashing a lot, you know, and that might be tough for some. It dep I guess it depends on what their foundation is to begin with, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but stay hydrated, definitely. And how do you know? And workload. So if you, you know, if you know you've got a busy week, don't go fasting. You know. Yeah. Maybe how, choose a weekend. How do you know if, if it's like, if the discomfort is that right level of discomfort, of, because you're doing something new, or whether it's like, okay, actually, this isn't, this is kind of pushing myself too much. You know, if you don't, if you're not working with a coach, I, I'm just wanting to make sure that. We're not putting in the right wrong, yeah. Yeah, that uh, anyone if in a anyone's vulnerable position. Listening, yeah, yeah I agree. I um, it's it's difficult for people now, isn't it? As I say, we've kind of lost this ability to self-medicate and know exactly what we want. We don't we don't necessarily trust the the gut instinct and the heart because the intellect has just been is this huge cap that sits on all of it now, and it's been this has been cultured more than this, right? I think it's changing now, but that's how I feel about it. So. Um, you, you, you basically just, you need to sit in it just for a little bit longer and just push the limits of it, you know? Just sit in it a bit longer, sit in it a little bit longer. How does it feel? Okay, I, it's not going right. Okay, now I'm gonna go. And then you, there's nothing to stop you from just having juices and just liquids. It's not, mm. in, there's no way within a 24, period, 24 hour period you're gonna starve to death. Or you have too much on board, you know, already. But there is, for some it might be, there's too much of a crash, or it might be something that's altered in their blood work, or something. You know, it can be. So um, it's like a mindfulness coach I worked with, and he said, "You just put, just push the edges just a little, and just see how where the discomfort is. Sit in it a little longer. And by sitting it, I mean really just put your put your energy and your thoughts in that area. You know, how it feels. And it's really feeling into it, so you don't use the your ego to kind of override. Exactly. Because you can use your ego to be like, no, but I said I was going to fast for four days, so exactly. I will. Yeah, yeah. Or you can use your ego to say, you know, actually this feels really unhealthy, so I'm going to now go and eat this and to kind of trick yourself out of it. And that ability to actually be able to listen to what's going on in your body and respond to that is, is something that takes practice. Oh, for sure. I just feel, I, you know, it's just such a shame that we went down this path where we've you know, it's been domesticated out. You know, we've lost the ability to really tune into what we, what it is we need. You know, because we're driven by want. You know what I mean? We're, we're all wanting, not understanding what needs are. Yeah, totally. There's yeah. a, there's a drill in like the apartment next door agreeing with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to drill this wall right now. Yeah. 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 Um, we don't need you to. <laughs> You mentioned earlier about how becoming a father was yeah. a big point for you in your own journey and in the journey of wanting to know more about all of this and share more about all of this. I would love to hear, 
I feel like there's not a huge amount of guidance for fathers. You know, there's a lot more for mothers out there of how to, you know, be a conscious mother. And I, you know, I know that there's quite a lot of guys listening that are recent fathers. Um, and I would love to hear something that you've discovered or what you've discovered that role is. Well, firstly, I think it's just, it has to start with you. So you, you have to understand that your children have chosen you really for a reason. Right? And so to honor that, you have, I, I feel you have to become the best example of self, you know? Because they learn through observation and observation alone. Right? Your words mean nothing really, it's, it's, they're observing everything about you. And you'll be amazed what they do listen to, you know? Suddenly it comes up years later, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Or <laughs> that it might be their tone and you realise, oh my God, I, I, I've spoke to one of them like that at some point, they picked up on it. So just remember they're recording everything. And then also there's a layering system to learning, so which I've picked up through um, Bruce Lipton and Joseph Chilton Pierce's work. So there's like the first thousand days um, is the emotional development. And in that time, they're literally recording everything, but on an emotional kind of energetic level as well. So what you're putting out, so your energy that you put out. So if you're a really stressed out organism, and dads can be like that when it's, you know, when a child comes into the home because it just changes everything. You know, the mother's love goes completely to the child and they might feel they're a little bit out of here and they have to learn how to become part of the unit again. And so the child picks up on all that emotional stuff, it's all coming in, it's incredible. Right? And then they have an imagination development, and, they, and then finally the intellectual development. And so as, 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 a, as, as I say, as a father, it was just for me, especially with three girls, I had to become a better man, you know. And so I had to look at my own templates of what a male is, you know, which can be quite challenging, you know. So I, I looked at my father, and I looked at my father's position, and then, I, and then I have to understand that I'm not my father and then I have to kind of divorce myself from that relationship in a sense to be a father. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then rebuild my own templates of what I think a masculine, mature masculine should be. Because there's a lot of immaturity in the masculine that walks around and operates, you know, and we see it in, in, in the modern landscape that we're in today, right? So, um... I guess for me it was just, yeah, it was just becoming the best example of self. So then looking at what, what is self, so there's a physical, social and spiritual again, and how can I be the change on all those levels? And then that rolls out to every child, it's not just your own children, because we look at that model that they're learning through observation, that it's every child is observing every adult behaviour, you know? So we all need to step up a bit here and say, well, they're all our children, right? That's the point. And so are my behaviours serving me because I'm the one that's being observed? And if they're not, why am I doing it? Which goes back to my original thing about the biological norm and the biological extreme. So I look at most of, the, uh, most of my approach as, is it biologically normal or is it biologically extreme? If it's biologically extreme, why am I doing it? You know, I have to question it, you know, because if it's not serving me and it's not serving others, I mean, what's the, why, why would I do that, you know? So that's, mm. that's kind of what came out of that as well. And that's relevant not just to the children, but just to all adults Everything, and because every, we're a tri it's we the tribe of influence. You're influencing everyone around you, you know? And were there any principles in your kind of journey into the, the new masculine that you feel are universal? Yeah, I feel um, it's, it's for me because I, I have three daughters now, so it's kind of uh, you know it's it's a very different, um, very different position I feel I'm in now within my family. You know, um, I see some I would say what they like seventy two year old clients they could be that are men, right? And it feels that they're still operating at the first six years of their life as a boy which yeah. is fascinating to look at. And so, um, again, you have to kind of divorce yourself from that somehow, you know? So I, I ask, 
I, meditation is a great practice again of going into mm -hmm. those first years or you know you might go down a, a, another route of plant medicine or it might be working with um, family constellation work I think is yeah. quite powerful. Well that's actually what I do with my intuitive I love that work. sessions. I go into the subconscious and I look at the, yeah. the kind of the What's the, the template? Yeah, the template from... And from all the ancestors, what they're carrying forward, you know? Yeah. And um, I think that's very, very powerful. Um, yeah, which is, again, that's how you're going to access... That's deep work, though, isn't it? You know, it's quite deep for people. So for just people who aren't prepared to go deep on themselves. I think just you have to, you have to, just, you have to look in the mirror, right? Am I, am, am I the best example in the mirror? Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, if we want to create a beautiful future, it involves all of us being prepared to look in the mirror and do of that course. deep work and yeah, yeah. figuring out how we can contribute. Yeah. On that, how does rewilding impact kind of society as a whole or the future as a whole? <laughs> Well, okay, I'll give you an example of this. So we, uh, I'll mention my three daughters again. So Lola, Millie, and Tallulah. They're, they're wonderful. I, I, mean, so I enjoyed watching them just running around barefoot, yeah. like, yeah. so confident, so... So they, yeah. they had no schooling. They were just completely unschooled, right? So, um, so we, we're not cookie-cuttering them to put them out into exactly the same format we have today. We're trying to think, well... What's the future? Is the current educational model of today setting them up for something in the future? Is um, asking them just to remember the same facts that some of them are 40 anyway going to set them up for the future? Um, and then, or do we honour this system of layering like the first three years and then to the age of seven and then the intellectual brain and then they take care of it themselves? Like Lola's already in that realm now. She's reading, writing, she's writing stories, doing screenplays, you know, and just, and just incredible. Now her maths has gone off like that. She doesn't need to write any of it down. She can just, you know, times tables are like this. And it's not like we're shoving her curriculum down her neck. She just wants to learn it and she's absorbent in that moment. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of honoring the rewilding. That's honoring just that, that innate system. It's in us, right? We just don't trust it. We think it has to be schooled in. It has to be sat in a chair and we learn that way. On the other side of that with them is they, have Katerina as this amazing feminine as a model, right? And then they already are doing things like carrying babies in slings, right? And I love that to be the norm because what, what happens there is that that's going into continuum concept, which is this, the lady that went off and lived with a tribe for five years and she understood that none of the children were crying ever because all their needs were met. So they were always picked up, always fed. The mothers were totally in tune with the babies. They were never separated, right? So there's no separation anxiety with the children. Until, of course, they meet the right levels when they're emotionally nourished and they can move away, which is that first thousand days again, right? And so there's a lot to learn from that. So I'm looking at working space and I'm thinking, well, how does rewilding change the future? And the best is basically looking at from this level and growing up. So in the co-working space, for instance, I would like to see floors dedicated to mother and baby, right? That's what I'd like to leave personally. That's what I, want to, what I want to work towards for a legacy for my kids, is to say that they're never faced with the decision of, I'm a woman, I want to have children. It's an innate thing, I want to have kids, versus I want a career, right? Because we should be able to, it should all be just one thing. So that's, a, that's how I see simple things from rewilding can literally just change our future based on continuing concept is because the ba the, there is no, there's a no, no emotional flaw in that child. It has all its needs met, you know, you've nurtured it. So there's no separation. So I'd like to see stuff like that. That would be amazing, you know, from a rewilding perspective. And then if we all were honoring a circadian rhythm and lighting, I mean, who knows what disease and illness is coming out of the fact that we're compromising this sunset, sunrise behavior and, and the circadian rhythm that comes with it. Digestion, if we all understood what digestion, the food groups we should be eating, you know? So I think just health and wellness and well-being, we just, well, we just grow, right? We grow as an organism that way. If our physical, social and spiritual needs are met, 
then we're in a position of emotional well-being. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? if you look at that model. Unfortunately, it was all monetary, right? so it's based on a, an accountant's model, really. right? So we can put everything in there, throw it all in there and say, right, what's the physical needs? We need water, we need food, we need sleep, we need rest. We need human contact. right? Um, we need sunlight, we need quality air. So they're all our physical foundations. But do we, or do we need nourishing foods right, that are organic and wild? Do we need clean spring water, or do we need tap water that has loads of toxins in it? So it's basically just taking all those wild aspects of Maslow, doing rewilding Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There we go. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. If we could do that, and then we'd have a great world to live in, right? Yeah. Well, it's a big project. It just takes all of us. <laughs> it's all a pretty of us big project. In. I must admit. <laughs> yeah. But again, that's um, it. Has to be talked about, doesn't it? it? Has to be discussed. Yeah. It has to be out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it is crazy that we have taken away our access to starlight, for example, mm -hmm. to seeing stars yep. um, and to being in that rhythm, and over, I forgot, forget the statistic, but more and more of us, as the population grows, and more and more of us are gonna move to cities. And so then when we are looking at health and well-being for the cities, we do need to actually start addressing this on a bigger level. Yeah. Do we want, do we want life open at full speed, seven days a week? Do we want lighting on all the time? Do we want to keep this office culture? Yeah. Or is that just going to make us all sick? Like we haven't had it for that long, like no. in terms of many generations. In terms of evolution, no. And we're seeing already all of these new diseases and the impacts that this lifestyle is having. Mm. A myriad of like 100 different autoimmune diseases. <sighs> wow, you know, we're, do we're so successful right now. You know, so we need to alter our, our perception of success, I guess. Yeah. You know, how successful am I as a, as a human being rather than how successful am I am based on my material. It starts by taking your shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, but just check, just look at every again. Just simply, it can be small change, little small steps. It doesn't have to be huge. The thing about it, when I explained it, you know, it's this. We just rewild the whole city. It doesn't have to yeah. be like that. It could be you could be doing one thing. Like you have plants in here. That's that's a step already. You're moving in that direction. You know, you have a salt lamp done, candle on done. You know, yeah. But it it, it doesn't does have to be scary in this big thing. It can be just simple little. It could be weekly. Right, this week I'm going to look at how I feed my cells. You know, next week people know more about their mobile phones than they do about their cells. Right, their cell phone than they do their own cells. But it also does make me think that there's quite an exciting proposition for government and other yeah. powers that be to seriously take into account our biological well-being yeah. and our mental well-being in a whole level that, that we're not right now. Mm. And in a way it does seem radical or wild, <laughs> but it, extreme, yeah. Uh, extreme, socially extreme, right? To imagine a world where, to imagine an urban life where actually it just became normal that everyone sort of went home from work at five or six and all those lights did get turned off and... Yeah, or, do, or they turn to amber tones, you know? It, it doesn't need to be off. Mm. You know, that's the point because the studies are showing that um, <clears throat> they had night shift workers with um, simulated night shift workers with blue and green spectrums of light in one box, let's say. In the central box then, putting people in boxes now, they have um, a sleep experiment in darkness and then the third box they have the same simulated um, work experience, night shift, but with amber light. No melatonin box number one, 
green and green blue spectrum. So box number two, sleep experiments, melatonin. And box number three, same, same simulated work experience, which is amber lights, they had melatonin. So it doesn't mean the city has to go to sleep, it just means we address the lighting. Mm -hmm. You know? And that seems quite easy. It's, it's so much easier, but we seem to be developing brighter and brighter bulbs, you know? Yeah. Like, this, like the arcade that the kids walk into, they're, they're attracted to all the bright lights, right? Ding, 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 and that's what we, that's what we do. But if we just blitz the city with amber lights at like a certain hour, bam, it all just switched. Then there's a transformation already. That can't be that difficult, right? Yeah, let's make that happen. Let's make that happen. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone listening, we need to make this happen. Yeah, any lighting dudes out there, come on. Let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we start an online campaign as, as one step and actually really share how the lighting is affecting us. Because I know so many people mm. that suffer with insomnia, yeah. just, you know, extreme levels of stress. Yeah. And this is such a simple way of Isn't it? increasing well-being for a huge number of people, for a society, for a whole community. Yeah, and there's people not benefiting from other practices. So I know I've been on retreats before, meditation retreats. Um, sound healing retreats, breathwork retreats, where immediately afterwards the lights go on, right? Mm. And it's like, wow, okay, I've just done all that amazing work and now just, just completely tripped all my, my hormonal system, you know? So, um, yeah, some, there's some, uh, I mean, imagine all that work, how pow more powerful stuff would be, yeah? Your own meditation practice, if you understood lighting alongside that. Mm hmm. Mm, there we go. Brilliant. Thank you, Tony. It's Thank you. Been, yeah, really interesting. Um, and so if people want to find out more, it's TonyRiddle.com? Yes, TonyRiddle.com, um, Instagram, at Tony Riddle. And there are some great videos on your website and yes. lots, of, yeah, lots of interesting resources. Yeah, and it's growing as well. We're doing a bit more work on that. And there's been some talks and things like that coming up, which um, I've been working on this year. And maybe a podcast, you know? Yeah, Great. or two. Yeah. Well, we look forward to all of that. Super. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you for listening. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast, and so it's made possible by you, our community. If you loved this and would like to contribute to our Patreon campaign or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes so we can grow. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together. <laughs>